Hi there, I'm John Michael Garropy and this is Popcorn Roulette. Each episode I invite a guest to come on the show, they suggest a movie, we get together and we talk about the movie. Today I have with me Matt Belfiore. Matt, how are you doing today? Excellent as always. Today we are getting together and we're talking about it's a mad, 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 mad world with, here is the list, Spencer yes. Tracy, Milton Berle, Buddy Hackett, Dorothy Provine, Dick Sean, Terry Thomas, Edie Adams, Sid Caesar, Ethel Merman, Mickey Rooney, Phil Silvers, Jonathan Winters, and directed by Stanley Kramer. Yes. Uh, but before we even get to that, we have to eat our snack for the day. I know Let's it's, it. it's a real letdown because you want to get to the movie. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Are you kidding me? I love pretzels, big yeah. soft pretzels. Now, the thing about the soft pretzels, just so you know, I just was at Disney World for like the last like week. Yes. And I've been eating like soft pretzels shaped like Mickey Mouse for forever. So, um, but at the same time, you can't get, you know, it's, it's soft pretzels. How can you go wrong? Yeah. And you got to have the mustard with the soft pretzels. Mm. If you don't do mustard with the soft pretzels, it's just a bread roll. I, uh, know, so. I at one point in time, was working for uh, uh, Millbrook, who delivers specialty foods for her uh, market basket. Yes. And we, uh, I, I, because we delivered so much, so many different types of mustards, I ended up becoming a mustard snob because nice. I'd bring home all these different varieties of things that we were having. Yeah. Mm. So is that what this is? This is good mustard? Or no, this is the terrible stuff. This comes yeah. from the. <laughs> this is the stuff that comes from the, from the, uh, from the, <laughs> the pretzel place. Yeah. yeah the, the the hind end of the mustard animal. Matt. Yes. Why mad 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 world? We're gonna say mad world from now on. That's fine. <laughs> Mad World is absolutely good. So, let's go back to 1978 or 77. I think it was 78, whatever it was. There were three things that I could watch that night. Right. It was, it was New Year's Eve, three things that were on. That was back when you had like nine channels or something. Right, right, it. right, right. And two were PBS. And two were PBS, so you're up there, you know. <laughs> and the other ones were, they were, they were UHF. It was New Year's Eve, so they were playing big movies. I had the um, premiere of the 1977 King Kong that was going to be on, or 76 King Kong, whatever okay. it was. Okay, all right. There was, I don't know, Wizard of Oz or something like that. And then there was this movie called It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. And my dad looked at me and said, this is the funniest movie I ever saw. This is a fantastic movie, funniest movie I ever saw. Okay. So I said, well, I'm a comedy guy. I love comedy. Let's watch right. it. I was a kid, but I'm like, let's watch it. Right, right. And from the second the thing turned on with the cartoon opening, yeah. um, Saul Bass did the, um, did, did, did the opening titles and... Uh, the crazy world bouncing and the whole thing. Um, right into it, I mean, I, at that point, it was the mid-70s, so all these comedians who were in this movie that you mentioned, right? I still knew them. I was a little kid, but I knew these guys. They were still they, in the zeitgeist. Yes. They were on Hollywood Squares, or they right. were on, you know. So I knew them. And to see this movie with so many of them in it, for me, was just crazy. You know, it was, it was incredible. And the funny thing about it is, is um, Spencer Tracy's in it. Yes. I didn't know Spencer Tracy at the time because I was a little kid. Right, you wouldn't have seen his yes. serious work that he did with Kramer. Yeah, yeah, you know. And since then, Spencer Tracy's kind of become like my favorite, like go-to golden age actor. So as we've I've, as I've gotten older, the movie stayed with me. It's always stayed with me. It's a very, you know, there's a lot of corn in it. You know, it's right. very, it's a very yuck yuck kind of movie. It's very, I, I, you know, the people say there's a dry sense of humor, and yeah. then I say, well, if there's a dry sense of humor, there's also a wet sense of humor. This movie's got a very wet sense of humor to it. Right. Um, it's dad joke full you know, of humor, sure. yeah. Which was, I think, that was the humor of the time. Right. Um, but there's also, um, I don't want to say moralistic message to it or anything, but there's a slightly darker side to it. And that slightly darker side, it's about greed and it's about what can happen if you give in to have greed and, and whatnot. It's, it's hammering it at home. You know, it's, it's, it's not subtle. Right. But because of that, as I've gotten older, some of the more... Uh, semi-adult things in the movie have resonated with me. Spencer Tracy's plight, his, that, that character's plight. So it's always stuck with me, and it's grown with me. It's a, one of those things that I can watch it as a little kid and see the yuck, yuck humor in it and people flying off of ladders and crashing cars and whatnot. Right. Um, and, and then I can also now, as I got older, in my teen years and further on, I can see the more, you know, humanistic, I don't know, desperate part of certain aspects of it you know? yeah yeah you, it's that. safe to say you've watched you've watched this a number of times a I bazillion presume. times yeah yes. yeah you've actually brought a couple of artifacts from the set I did. right i did let's take a look so we can get screen grabs of these later but right what you're going to see here is this kind of gaudy belt buckle okay <laughs> but what you don't see about this gaudy belt buckle is there's some glass that's been embedded in this belt buckle there's a big w on it the glass that's in this the opening sequence of the movie 
Jimmy Durante, a name that you know people our age would probably know, but a yeah. lot of the younger generation, they're not going to know. Jimmy Durante crashes his car, flies off this cliff, the very opening scene, slams his car into the ground. Um, they shot it on the, I think it's called the Palms to Pines Highway in um, California. Yeah. There must be tons of rock slides there all the time. <laughs> because, I mean, you look at it, it's nothing but, you know. It is an insanely <coughs> dangerous highway. Yes. They chose it for a reason. Yeah. So, fast forward somewhere in the 80s, okay? This guy, Dave Woodman, he's actually an animator. He did work for uh, Disney. I know he worked, I believe, on Ursula from The Little Mermaid. Anyways, okay. getting off to the side. But he's a big fan of this movie. Um, another rabid, crazy you know, Mad World fan. He actually went to the location where they shot this. He went down into the gully in the 80s where the car crashed. Back in the 60s, they didn't do any, they didn't do a lot of cleanup. They just hauled the wreck out and left everything there. Right. And he found all the old glass and he found all these old pieces from that car. So what he did, because he knew there was enough of us out there who were crazy enough to want this stuff. Right. Is he went ahead and he made this, got this belt buckle with the W and he put the glass in it. And he has all this jewelry that he made out of the glass from that car. I had to pick one up. I bought one, and uh, I love it just because I got a piece of something that was actually a part of that movie. Right. And I think it's pretty cool. Uh, most people geek out about things like Star Wars. Other people <laughs> geek out about, you know, yeah. uh, Marvel comics or whatever. I geek out about it. it's a mad, 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 mad world. I'm, yeah. I'm weird. And the other thing I have is um, the big, you know, the big um, resolution towards the end is where's the money buried? Right. And spoiler alert for whatever you want to say. Uh, yeah. Most people have seen the movie. It's buried under a big W. People don't know where the big W is. They're all looking for the big W. The big W is basically four palm trees that are planted shaped like a W. And the palm trees were there up until the 70s or whatever. They were pulled out from, from the location. There was one palm tree left. It was cut down. There was a stump. They started calling it the big comma because it was nothing but a stump. And when they pulled <laughs> that final stump out, this guy named Price Morgan who's another crazy, rabid, mad, mad world fan. Right. Um, he went down there and actually, like, cut pieces of the stump away. So that's interesting, because that's a private estate, too, at the same exact time. Yes. So, like, did he have permission to get uh, go on the property? Or? Yes, he did. He had okay. permission. I believe you had permission. Bro. I hope you watched this. <laughs> if you didn't, well, you know, let's pretend you did. No, but I'm pretty sure he had permission. Yeah. And um, he actually got these pieces, and so I actually have some little flex of the actual piece of the big W, which for me, again, is really cool. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm a geek about it. What can I say? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, those, are my, those are my, you know, memorabilia of the movie. Right. You know. Well, and we always, in every single episode, we end up put, pulling up a, a, a negative review because I'm, of course, I'm yeah, really yeah. going to be doing it myself. So I, yep. I foist the negative reviews on it. people from the Internet. Yes. This one comes from Dwight McDonald, who was written in Esquire in June of 1965, uh, titled Whatever Happened to Hollywood Comedy. Humor is like guerrilla warfare. Success depends on traveling light, striking unexpectedly, and getting away fast. Stanley Kramer's attempt to revive slapstick in It's a Mad, 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 Mad World fails for every possible reason, but one that is more like the Battle of the Somme than a Viet Cong raid. To watch on Cinerama screen in full color a small army of actors inflict mayhem on each other with cars, planes, explosives, and other devices for more than three hours with stereophonic sound effects is simply too much for the human eye and ear to respond to, let alone the funny bone. Like, <laughs> I... Yeah, go ahead. Respond. Well, I feel that comedy is in the eye of the beholder. It's all relative. Yeah. Okay? There are people who think Jerry Lewis is the greatest thing on the face of the earth. Right. And there are people who look at that and go, what the <laughs> hell is this? What are you thinking? Okay, this, this isn't just funny at making all. strange faces at yes. you. Yeah. It's, uh, it's such a subjective thing. Yeah. Um, and I think that as a co if, you're, if you're a comedian or, or a comedy writer or anything, it's... You've got the, one of the hardest jobs in the world because you're trying to appeal to a broad, the broadest blanket that you can with humor. But everybody has a different idea of what's funny. Yeah. To me, I think that if you look at what this guy's saying, or there's a lot of reviews like that out there. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's one yeah. of the most, it's a very polarizing movie. Yeah. There's a lot of people who hate it, and then there's a lot of people who just love it. Either you get it or you don't. You gotta kind of just submit yourself to it, right. and just be like, "Look, it's big, it's ridiculous, it's over the top, it's assaulting like a tsunami." You know, it's it's craziness. Um, it's funny you mentioned that. I have a friend. Um, he actually said, you know, for your, like last year, they were playing this in uh, you know cinema cinerama. Uh, 70 millimeters, not really Cinerama, it's, it's 70 yeah, millimeters. Yeah, they cheated. They call yeah. it Cinerama, it's not. It's not. Cinerama, Cinerama is three, 
actual movie projectors running at the same time to give this real big surrounding depth sort of, sort of thing. This was a curved screen, and it was shot with one camera. It was like one of the first, I think it was the first movie that was ever done that way. But I went and I saw it in 70 millimeter with my friend. He had never seen it. And obviously we're there, it's, a, it's, a, it's at a revival house. People are gonna, you know, the people who are there are already fans. But the laughter was uproarious. My friend who had never seen it walked out and said, hey, it delivered the goods. You know, it did, yeah. it did what it was supposed to do. And um, I think it does. I think it, in, in, in the long and short of it, it, del it delivers the goods. And again, it, part, a lot of it's personal for me, but I think in a lot of cases it's comedy. Comedy is pers a personal thing. Mm. Um, and I love it. And I think when we were talking beforehand about it, I think that this movie, and I've always said this, this movie is at the, at the precipice of the change in tone in the country. Yeah. And in, 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 in the national, what we thought was funny or what, what wasn't and pre mid century, you know, uh, fifty five to sixty, fifty sixty, and going backwards, it was a far more uh, simple. I don't like to say simplistic, just right, a different right. feel to it. You know, after that, after the after sixty three, sixty four, it got darker. You know, there was a much a darker phase that lasted up to, and I think that it it also um, steered the way for like a lot of my generation, which is Gen X. Uh, we're kind of a very cynical generation. And yeah. I think that a lot of that came from the humor that we were exposed to at the time. Right. This movie has got the feel of a 1950s sort of big, splashy, yuck, yuck comedy type of thing. Right. But it's got this really kind of dark... You already see these negative influences because like yeah. everybody, when we talk about the 60s, we tend to blame the Vietnam War and we tend to blame uh, the entire Nixon... Uh, problem the Watergate scandal yeah. but like here we are we're 63 and we're talking about greed and yeah. we're already seeing a major shift in the way the country is looking at itself much of it's just like walking out of the 50s and saying like I thought this was the American dream we don't seem to be living much yes. better well a lot of people were living in a better lifestyle but they weren't enjoying their lives more yeah and I think that that's starting to creep in and I always I always make this joke to people that I you know I talk to this movie came out I believe it was like either like the week before or the week after Kennedy had been shot. Yeah. Okay. So it was, like, it was like literally three days before yeah. Kennedy got shot, and yeah. then it did really well despite that. But yeah. It I, was just like strange timing. But it was right there, and now if you go just a little bit further, another couple of months, four or five months into '64 or whatever it is, Doctor Strangelove comes out, which is a very dark, dark satire, nihilistic. It's another one of my favorite movies. But I've always joked that Stanley Kramer in It's a Mad, 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 Mad World destroys his entire cast. Yeah. In the end. And Stanley Kubrick, when he did Dr. Strangelove, one-upped him by destroying the entire world. <laughs> so it's like, uh, you can see a trend happening, but I always right. felt like Mad Mad World is really right there where it's like that crossover. And to me, so it speaks to a lot of the stuff that I knew of as a kid, yeah. but also to a lot of the cynicism that I kind of you know, was exposed to as a, as a yeah. teenager and a young adult. So it's, it's, it's in a really weird place, and well, it's huge, so it's, you know... Taking a step back, because we're talking about uh, like the nature of comedy itself, Jonathan Winters, and I'm paraphrasing here, yeah. happened to say that I can give you a funny costume, I can give you some really funny lines, and make you do some funny shtick with some physical stuff. I can't make you funny. Yeah. Like, how are these men and women funny? What makes them yeah. funny? Well, I think a, when you watch this, right, and that's a good point, because if you watch this, there's a, there's a really cool dynamic that goes on in this movie. Stanley Kramer is not a wasn't a stereotypical comedy director. He no. was a dramatic director, did these message movies, the whole thing. He got a script written by one of the greatest screenwriters of all time, William Rose, and his wife, William and Tanya Rose, wrote this script. He also wrote the original Lady Killers. He wrote a lot of the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming. So he had this script. He wanted to make a comedy. He wanted to make a gargantuan comedy. He brought in all of the comedians that he could get at the time. Most of them were television comedians. Because they were television comedians, most of them, not all of them, Mickey Rooney really wasn't a television comedian. He was more of a comedic actor, maybe. Ethel Merman, too, you know. But back then, when they did their stuff in the 50s, it was all live. Right. So they had to, like, know how to make people laugh by just making a face. You know, the, because you're live. You're going to be in front of millions of people every week with brand new material. you you got to get good at being funny. Right. And all of those people, if you watch them, Milton Berle is mugging. He's trying his best to upstage everybody. He's always the last man on always, camera. Always the last guy on camera. You know, you watch Sid Caesar, okay? That guy, 
the facial tics, the, 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 the things that he's doing, he's doing them almost like instinctively. Yeah. You know? And I think I, I read somewhere where he had said in an interview that he was kind of sleepwalking through that part because he was doing three other things at the same time and he was having some other issues or whatever. But he said that, you know, he kind of slept walked through that. And I look at that performance and I'm like, this is one of That's the most... It's a strange sleepwalk. <laughs> yeah, you know? <laughs> like, he, he comes out as being one of the better performers as far as I'm concerned in that, in that yeah, movie. Yeah, you know? And I look at that and I go, like, how, how does he do that? This is just, like, a natural thing for him. Like, even, even if you take a look at, like, I know I've see, seen, like, some documentary with Buddy Hackett. Yeah. And, like, you can't get this guy to shut up. I could only imagine what it must have been like on the set. Oh. He would just, like, there'd be Buddy Hackett and Jonathan Winters would be sitting there. Yeah. And Jonathan Winters, as much as he's got a blabbermouth, he seems like a pretty shy guy. You know, yeah, and Jonathan Winters just walk all over him yeah, in the yeah. process to get his jokes out. Yeah, I think that, that was another part of it. I think that they're all trying to, like, maybe if not outdo each other, like, keep up with each other in yeah. that movie, you know? And if you look at it, somebody like Milton Berle, who's probably one of the, like, wackiest, over-the-top comedians that there was at the time, plays really straight. I mean, he's got the henpecked husband nervous thing down, you know? Right. But it's not like he's, like... They didn't give him jokes. No, it wasn't, like, a jokey part, you yeah. know? It was a character part, you know? Right. And, and here's the thing about um, Stanley Kramer, yeah. being a dramatic director. I think one of the biggest pieces of genius in this whole movie was that he had Spencer Tracy in it. Spencer Tracy brought something into that movie. When you watch that character and you watch his performance, you've got this crazy stuff going all around. And then you've got Spencer Tracy, who is giving such a realistic, grounded performance mm. and holding the whole thing together. And I've said this, and, and I think this speaks to Kramer, because Kramer got Tracy. They'd worked together. They were good friends, and he got him to be in it. If you take another director of the time, let's take a typical comedy director, somebody like Frank Tajlin or something, he did a lot of Jerry Lewis movies or whatnot, they would have probably put somebody like a, a, a typical comedy authority figure of the time in there. So you would have gotten like Gail Gordon, who was like Lucille Ball's boss on the Lucy show, you know, Lucy, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm flustered and I'm, I'm <laughs> dramatic, blah, 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 you know. Right. And you wouldn't have had that grounding. It would have just been full cartoon. Someone for the audience to relate to. Because like yeah. one of the things I was going to bring forward was that uh, there's a, a Batman comic, uh, comic from like the late 1980s, early 1990s. And okay. it's the concept is, is that the Joker feels like he became the Joker because he had one horrible day and that yeah. just broke him. And then yeah. he tries to do that to Commissioner Gordon. Yeah. Spencer Tracy is having one bad day. Yes. And it is so unrealistic to imagine a man going from being like the best police chief out yep. there, incredibly honest guy, yep. to America's most wanted by the yes. time we get to the end of yep. the movie. Yep. How is he pulling that off? Does he yep. pull it off? Well, for me, and this is, that's a good, another good point, because William and Tanya Rose, yeah. when this thing was written, it was originally like, I think the original cut was like five hours long or some craziness like that. And one of the things that they were very disappointed about was that where Kramer cut a lot, there was a whole other subplot where uh, Spencer Tracy's mother-in-law was driving him crazy and yeah. his brother-in-law was driving him crazy and uh, there was more of his life falling apart and they felt as writers that they didn't that by cutting so much out it wasn't as realistic that he would do what he does at the end yeah um but does it seem almost too absurd when they stack too much stuff on him at the same exact time i i think that for me yeah it's just about right, and I think that any other actor maybe wouldn't have sold it right. as well that he's going to go there. But another thing that we also have to talk about with the Spencer Tracy character is he plays up against William Demarest for most of it, okay, who right. was Uncle Charlie on My Three Sons, and that's from, uh, anybody's probably going to know him from now, but he was such a great character actor. And the two of them together, they know how to take maybe a slightly flimsy thing and with their mannerisms and with the way they act to sell it. You know, and for me, he sells it enough that, it, you know, it does, it does the job, you know. And yeah. I know that um, I, I did an interview um, years ago with um, Paul Scrabo, another guy. He, uh, I could go on about this forever, but <laughs> basically Paul Scrabo was one of the uh, handful of folks who really kept this movie, like, in the public eye and really championed it forever. And he did one of the first restorations on this movie. He found a bunch of the footage, and he did it in uh, basically in old three-quarter inch tape, technical stuff. Don't want to get there. You know, we had been talking about it, and he said that when he interviewed Kramer, Kramer said that a woman walked up to him at the end of the movie and said something to the, to the effect of, I love the movie all the way up until you made Spencer Tracy take the money. 
Right. And he was like, but that's the whole point of the movie. Right. Uh, without that, you just got a bunch of people running around like, you know, maniacs. Yes. And, uh, it is just a silly comedy. This gives us some gravitas. A little bit. Right. You know, I mean, not so, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's still in the, in the end just a silly comedy. Right. But, God, that performance to me, and I mean, the guy was practically dying when he made the movie. Spencer Tracy couldn't even do most of the, the running at the end where he's got to run up and down and all over the place. Cause right. He was, he was in bad shape. They were right? using yeah. a uh, stuntman just he, to have Spencer Tracy run upstairs. Yes, because he, <laughs> he wasn't in good shape. He yeah. was a heavy drinker in the whole. But man, what he does when he's just sitting there behind that desk is, you know, to me, fantastic. And I mean, and we're just talking about him. I mean, we're not right. even talking about. Well, uh, let, let's yeah. talk about somebody else. Who do you think had the best chemistry in this movie? You know, I love the stuff with Buddy Hackett and Mickey Rooney. Yeah. I think Buddy Hackett, that face is so cartoonish in and of itself and so expressive and he cracks me up just you know when you talk about being funny it's like and how i said like it's almost instinctive right if you listen to the way like they even just they pronounce their words like buddy hackett there's one point where they the cop comes down and he's like was he dead or wasn't he dead and he says you know his lines practically <laughs> but he doesn't say practically <laughs> he says practically yeah and it's like it's just even the way the guy talks is funny. where did that come from yeah, I, it's you know, like they he trained for that you know it's like they just know i gotta do it and i gotta do it funny yeah i love his stuff i think if i had to pick out one that i really i really love in that whole movie it's, i love them all but god i really love sid caesar and yeah the reason i gotta say i love the, this character is there's a, something in comedy for me that when it seems a little bit like uncomfortable it's really like it makes it almost more funny for me because it's like, oh, should I be? That's funny, but it's like there's scenes with him down there in that basement with Edie Adams, right? Where he's losing his mind, and he doesn't just lose his mind in a cartoon blah, kind of way, right? There's a point where like he's smashing the the burglar alarm. He tries to get the burglar alarm to go off. They run into a, a hardware store to get a pick and a shovel. They get locked in. So even though they're the first one there by hours. They're locked in. They can't get out. Irony, uh -huh, you know. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. So he's bashing away at this this burglar. I'm trying to get it to go off, and it doesn't go off. And there's a point where he looks into the camera, and he could have delivered the line as you know. Hammy. Yeah, but he delivers it with this ferocity that almost in his eyes almost makes him like Robert De Niro-ish scary for like a split second, and you're like, he finds a way to bring like even though he's doing a lot of crazy like hammy like um, facial things. He still brings something of realism. There's something to that it. makes you think to yourself, that that could be me, or yeah. I know a guy like that. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like I, my dad is like that. He would just flip yes. out in this scenario. And maybe because he's kind of the voice of reason at the beginning of all of those people, he's the guy that we're gonna get equal shares, and he's trying to like be the guy who rounds everybody up, and then they basically all tell him to go to hell. Yeah. And I think for him, and I think again, Paul Scrave was a guy who said that you know it's not about the money for this character. Right. He just wants to beat them because he just wants to show them what kind of a man they're dealing with as, as the characters. It is kind of interesting because the more you can actually imagine this person in your real life, the more you end up relating to them. Obviously, like Buddy Hackett, yeah. um, he's, he's funny to watch, but at the yeah. same exact time, I don't know many Buddy Hackett's, yeah. but I, I certainly know people like Sid Caesar. Exactly. I know people like Jonathan Winters, yes. who's just like, no, no, we have to report this money to the IRS. Yes. And it's the, no, How? don't do it. How can you do that? <laughs> How can you, you look at him and say, this tax-free money. If yeah. you go and dig this money up, that, that's stolen money, it's tax-free money. And he looks at him and says, well, we've we got to report it to the government, otherwise it's stealing. <laughs> you know? And, and about, about Jonathan Winter's performance. Everybody always talked about the garage scene, how he destroys the garage right. and the whole thing. I love that scene. I've seen it a million times. But that is Stanley Kramer's performance. That is, yeah. that is the stuntman's performance. Exactly. For me, though, for somebody like him, he's so... For Jonathan Winters, reserved. I mean, yeah. he's not doing a lot of shtick, and what he does is subtle. Like Phil Silvers picks him up, he picks him up driving on the little girl's bike, um, and then Phil Silvers, you know, tricks him and says, okay, uh, you better pick that bike up. Somebody's going to stumble over it in the dark in the middle of the desert, you know, takes off on him. He realizes that he's taken off on him, and he loses it. But again, he doesn't lose it in a way that's like, he loses it in a more angry way than in a it's funny as all hell right but it's angry too and yeah. it's there's something real there and i 
I attribute a lot of that to Kramer because he was a director and he had to direct the tone of these people to some yeah, extent. Yeah, had to figure out how to get these great performances yeah, out Yeah, you know, and uh, I, 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 yeah. Matt, we burned through our time here. Sure it took us like no time to do it, but yeah. you probably would want to talk about the studio and what's going on here at HC Media. Sure. Um, before we actually Yeah, we could say a little bit here. about yeah. what's going on, you know. We've got, you know, Harbor Place uh, location that just opened up down there called Studio 101. Yeah. Which, um, you know, it's a training facility, it's a... Um, it's, a, it's a performance venue, it's a full studio, um, so there's a lot of fun things going on down there. Um, there's always there's tons of stuff going on around here, there's uh, you know, something along the lines of 30 shows just like your own that go on every month, are recorded by the wonderful Sarah Blackstone. Sarah. <laughs> hey Sarah. Um, there's a lot of, um, uh, all, all the stuff that we do here, you know, we, yeah. we cover every event that happens in the city, whether it's a chamber event or whether it's a political event. Or, uh, we try to do our best to uh, do as much as we can, and if any of you folks out there want to come down and become a member and have a show just like John Michael Garropy here, hey, please <laughs> show up. It's very easy. Talk to Tiffany Vegan Stearns, our training coordinator. She'll get you in here. She'll teach you all the things you need to know, get you to sign away your life and the paperwork that we give you, and then it's game on. Yeah. So, well, that was our show. Hey, it was great having you. It was great having you on, Matt. If uh, you enjoyed this, subscribe to uh, subscribe to our channel. Give us a like. Go to HavelCommunityTV.org. You can also find us on YouTube. Take care now. Bye-bye.